I would like to thank each of you for gathering here today to commemorate and reflect on the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Today we gather to honor one of the most prominent leaders of the American Civil Rights Movement. Dr. King's extraordinary oratorical and rhetorical gifts, along with his profound actions, have left a lasting mark on America and the world as a whole. With the powerful legacy that is just as undeniable as it is inspirational, Dr. King was a man of rich faith who sought equality and human rights for not just African Americans, but for all people, the economically disadvantaged and all victims of injustice through peaceful protests. Dr. King teaches us that I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. This philosophy of King calls to my attention the story of the Good Samaritan in the Bible that demonstrates how we should love our neighbors as ourselves. Who are our neighbors, you may ask? Well, anyone in which we are neighborly. You see, King Thoughts helps us realize that every single day we find ourselves on a winding, curving road between Jerusalem and Jericho. Jericho roads in a crime-ridden East St. Louis. Jericho roads in a violent South Chicago. Jericho roads in a poor, drug-ridden small town. Every day we're faced with choices. The choice of being the Levite, being the priest, or being the Good Samaritan. King Guidance sheds a light on a true love, an extreme love, that extreme love that makes that decision for us because our destiny is tied together. Dr. King's legacy teaches us that we all have a moral and civic duty to be kind and compassionate to, to another, to have a tough mind, but yet a tender heart, to have faith as small as a mustard seed, to embrace our God-given purpose that is bigger than self, and to have a forgiving heart towards our neighbors, just as in Christ forgave each and every person in this room. Now, we will begin our celebration with a piece by our very own chamber singers dedicated to the legacy of MLK.
Let's give one more round of applause for those chamber singers. All right, my name is Angel Delgadillo. I am a fellow of the Freedom Fellows, and I am here to welcome Jacqueline Rivers with her bio. Dr. Jacqueline C. Rivers is a lecturer in sociology at Harvard University, the executive director and senior fellow for social science and policy of the Seymour Institute for Black Church and Policy Studies, and a senior fellow at the King's College in New York City. She was a Hutchins Fellow in the W.E.B. Dubois Research Institute at Harvard University and has presented at Princeton University, the University of Notre Dame, the University of Pennsylvania, the Vatican, Stanford University, the United Nations, and in several other venues. Her publications include The Paradox of the Black Church and Religious Freedom in the University of St. Thomas Law Journal, a chapter in volume of Not Just Good, But Beautiful, Another in Race and Covenant, Recovering the Religious Roots for American Reconciliation, and a chapter co-authored with Orlando Patterson in the Culture Matrix, published by Harvard University Press. Dr. Rivers works with leaders in the ecumenical Black Church to promote a philosophical, political, and theological framework for a pro-poor, pro-life, pro-family movement, and has worked on issues of social justice and Christian activism in the Black community for more than 30 years. She serves on the Board of Advisors for the Religious Freedom Institute, the Board of Directors for the Beckett Law, the Board of the Directors for the Center for Early African Christianity, and on the Religious Liberty Initiative Board of Advisors at University of Notre Dame. Please help me welcome Dr. Jacqueline C. Rivers. Well, it is really an honor, a privilege, a joy to be back at Notre Dame with all of you. It is so encouraging to be here and see the incredible work that's being done and to meet all of the students. And I'm very grateful to President Minnis for inviting me, for asking me for his support for this event, uh, to Dean Joe Wirtz and for the work that he has done, and of course, to Tyler Shepard and for Tyler's work in pulling this all together. I know that this is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, but tonight I don't want to just talk about King. I want to talk about the kind of issues that I think he would have been addressing today if he were alive. And I want to start in a surprising place. How many people saw Wakanda forever? Okay, not as many as I thought. You know it was the second most viewed film in the country. And it has a fantastic ending. So the princess is fighting against the underwater king who has killed her mother. And there is this pitched battle and he pins her to a rock with his spear, and you think, oh, it's over, she's dead now. But no, she rips the spear out, and she leaps over him and confronts him again, and she's discovered his weakness is heat, that he can't get dried out, he loses his strength, and so she engineers this huge explosion, and he is thrown to the ground, and he's dying. And she stands over him full of vengeance, because he's murdered her mother. Well, first of all, that's a victory, right? That she's defeated him. But the bigger victory comes next, because she forgives him. She hears her mother's voice, and she allows him to live if he will surrender. A fantastic ending. A fantastic ending in which black people win. A fantastic movie in which Black people have this extraordinary science, a fantastic ending in which a woman wins. It's just a fairy tale, you know, a Marvel comic. It isn't real. And today we are here not to talk about fairy tales, but to talk about truth. To talk about truth. Scripture emphasizes the importance of truth. The Apostle Paul tells us that we should speak the truth 
in love. We can't speak the truth in love if we don't know what the truth is. And today, knowing what the truth is, is no simple thing. There is so much misinformation, disinformation, deep fakes, it's hard to know what the truth is. But we must know the truth if we're going to follow the scriptural injunction to speak the truth in love. Paul tells us that the, we must buckle our, around our waist the belt of truth, that it equips us for spiritual battle. So truth is important. The Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth is essential because Jesus himself is the truth. And he promises us that the truth will set us free. So as much as I love the fairy tale of Wakanda, I want to talk tonight about truth and about history. William Faulkner, a Southern Nobel laureate said, the past is never dead, it's not even past. We ignore history at our peril. And there's a deep connection between truth and history. But truth is more than facts. But it is rooted in facts. It's rooted in what actually happened. And you know, let me just say that, as, that we don't have to go to a fairy tale like Wakanda to see glorious things in Africa's history. The construction of the pyramids is one of the wonders of the world. The largest pyramid at Giza is almost 500 feet high. An incredible structure with over 2 million blocks, on average weighing 2.5 tons. How did the ancient Egyptians accomplish this engineering miracle? It points to an incredible mastery of the art and science and engineering of the time, which even today engineers cannot figure out how the Egyptians could have done this. Or think about the empires of Western Africa, the kingdom of Mali, which in the 14th century covered a large swath of West Africa, far larger than the country now known as Mali. There, Mansa Musa, one of the rulers developed an important cultural center. In 14th century Africa, a center for Islamic universities, a center for impressive libraries, not what we normally think about when we think about Africa, a center of culture and learning. And Mansa Musa himself was so incredibly wealthy that when he went on the Hajj, because he was a Muslim, and the Hajj is a the obligatory visit to Mecca. When he went on this visit from West Africa to Mecca, as he traveled, he spent so much gold that the price of gold was depressed in Egypt for 12 years after his Hajj. He was incredibly wealthy, not the picture that we think about when we think about Africa. But even though I'm, I'm on focus on history and truth, I like fairy tales like Wakanda. I even like comics. I don't know if any of you like comics, but I really enjoy a good comic. Maybe it's just, you know, an old people thing. Maybe it's something you wouldn't understand. Maybe I'm just hiding my head in the sand, clinging to fairy tales. Surely other people don't do that, do they? Let's talk a little bit about truth in American history. And here is where I think we're talking about something that would have been really important to Dr. King. There is a Southern fairy tale, the fairy tale of the lost cause, which denies the importance of the role of slavery in the Civil War in which over 700,000 Americans died. The lost cause denies the horrors of slavery it denies that it was a terrible thing to deprive millions of their freedom. It denies the terror of potential and actual violence which was necessary to control slaves. The Lost Cause says that slavery was kind 
and beneficial to black people. The black people were so subhuman that what they needed were white masters to care for them. It denies the fact that it was this act of slavery, this history and legacy of slavery that was essential and central to establishing Jim Crow and the terrorism of the segregated South. But the truth is very different from the myth of the lost cause. For at least four decades, this country was locked in a struggle over the fate of slavery prior to the Civil War. It was a very heated debate. And as new territories entered the Union in the early 19th century, the question of whether those new territories would enter as slave states or free states roiled the entire country and had implications for slavery throughout the nation. And so the first attempt at a solution was the Missouri Compromise in 1820, which limited the existence of slavery in the Louisiana Purchase in territories joining the country through the Louisiana Purchase. Everything north of the 36th parallel was supposed to be free. It admitted once uh, Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state, but it didn't hold. By 1850, you have the Compromise of 1850, which brought in four new states with varying uh, statuses in terms of slavery. One free, one slave, and two under popular sovereignty, where the population in those states got to decide whether or not they were free. In addition to that, the Compromise of 1850 included a much harsher Fugitive Slave Act which imposed heavy penalties on anyone who helped runaway slaves. I know that you have heard of the Underground Railroad, in which northerners were often helping slaves who were escaping the South. Sometimes even those who lived in the South were involved in helping runaway slaves. And now they were going to face incredibly harsh penalties. In fact, Constables who were responsible for recovering slaves, if they were to lose a slave that they had recovered, also faced harsh penalties. And black people who were accused of being runaway slaves could not even speak in their own defense. They could not testify. And this led to huge abuses. Some of you may have seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, which was actually based on the life of Solomon Northup. Northup was a free man living in the north who was taken captive. He was kidnapped, and because he couldn't even defend himself, was enslaved by his kidnappers, was taken back to the south supposedly as a runaway slave. These kinds of abuses really led to a lot of resistance in the north. So slavery was really creating a lot of anger, division, and unrest in the United States. And in fact, it contributed significantly to the start of the Civil War. South Carolina was the first state to secede from the nation. And in December 1860, its justification for secession cited the Fugitive Slave Act as the one grounds on which it was leaving the Union. So this idea that slavery was not central is really contrary to the history. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which actually repealed the Missouri Compromise, effectively permitted slave once more in northern states, because remember, it had been limited to the 36th parallel. And Kansas and Nebraska were admitted to the Union on the popular sovereignty, so their populations got to decide whether they were slave or free, which led to bleeding Kansas. 55 people died in the struggle over whether Kansas would enter the Union as a free state. And the Southern-dominated Congress would not permit entry to the Union when Kansas finally decided to apply for admission as a free state. And it, Kansas was not admitted to the Union until after the Confederate states seceded. So the question of slavery created great strife, led to the secession of South Carolina, or contributed to the secession of South Carolina, which was ultimately followed by 10 other states, though five slave states did remain in the Union. Slavery was a key cause of the Civil War. 
despite the myth of the lost cause. Another place where I think we have to talk about truth right now, and where Dr. Martin Luther King would be interested in the question of truth, is in the way in which critical race theory is being discussed. I want to try and make some steps towards discussing the truth there. Critical race theory has been much aligned and deliberately misrepresented. You say, how do you know deliberately misrepresented? It's not just that people misunderstand. Well, Christopher Rufo of the Manhattan Institute tweeted on March 15, 2021, and I quote, we have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. Clearly a, a deliberate strategy to discredit the idea of critical race theory. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. Not an attempt to reach truth, not an attempt to represent fairly, but a deliberate strategy to turn people against critical race theory. Critical race theory is not even taught in middle school or high school. It's probably not even taught to most college students, primarily restricted to graduate students in some fields. But one key goal of Christopher Rufo and his colleagues was to undermine the teaching of accurate history in US schools, to make ugly parts of US history. There are many glorious things about US history. The fact that the Union fought to end slavery is a glorious thing about US history. The fact that the United States is the most powerful country in the world, the richest country in the world, is an impressive achievement. There is much good to talk about in US history. But we need to talk about all of the truth, and not just about some of the truth. So I want to talk a little bit more about critical race theory. There's so much confusion about what it is that I thought I would go to two of the key theorists, Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanik, to see how they describe it. And they say that there are five central tenets to critical race theory. One, racism is normal. That black people regularly encounter racism in daily life and that it's not in restricted to just dealing with intentional racists. It's not just the people of whom there are relatively few today, thank God, another accomplishment in the US history, who would actually come out and claim to be racists, but that it's an element of everyday life. Another tenet is of interest convergence theory. The conditions for blacks only improve when their interests converge with those of whites. A third is that race is socially constructed. It's not truly biological, but it's defined by social conventions. And differential racialization, that racism doesn't affect all blacks equally or in the same way, that there is what they call a unique voice of color. In Jamaica, we would say, he who feels it knows it. In other words, you don't really know what it's like till you've experienced it for yourself. That people experiencing racism have a unique understanding of it and are most qualified to address the problems. So I don't want to tell you that critical race theory is all right. That everything, every claim made in the name of critical race theory should be defended. I just want to explore two things though that I think are worth considering. One is, that black people encounter racism regularly in the course of daily life. Even when they're not dealing with outspoken outright racists. Deva Pager was a leading sociologist at Harvard University. And her work points to the way race affected employment opportunities, especially for poor black men. So she did this study in, that was published in 2003, 
in which she looked at what are called back rates for black men trying to get jobs. And she sent out pairs of testers. So a pair of white college students on one team and a pair of black college students on one team. And she made an effort to kind of match them on appearance and demeanor and dress so that employers would kind of see them uh, as more or less equivalent other than for race. But the other thing that she varied was she gave them the same resumes, except they took turns presenting a resume that reported a criminal history or a resume that did not. So the black team would go to employer one and, not, and give them a resume that didn't say they had a, critical, uh, a criminal record. Then they would go to employer two and give them a resume that said they did have a criminal record. And then the white team would do the same thing. Make sense? Get the design? OK. And then she waited to see how many employers called back and said, come in for an interview. White men, and she only did men, without a criminal record were called back 34% of the time. White men with a criminal record were called back less frequently, 17% of the time. Black men with a criminal record were called back even less frequently, only 5% of the time. But what's really surprising is that black men without a criminal record were only called back 14% of the time, less frequently than a white man with a criminal record. Just in case all of that you know, garbage, verbiage makes it unclear, let me say it again. If you were a black man without a criminal record, you were less likely to be called back than if you were a white man with a criminal record. Race affects black people every day. Residential segregation. About 60% of the population in major cities across the US would have to move in order to overcome residential seg segregation in this country. More than half of the population would have to move. So race affects where people want to live. Camille Charles did a study of residential preferences in 21st century Los Angeles and found that 20% of whites, one in five, preferred neighborhoods with no black households in the 21st century. And the average white respondent preferred a neighborhood that was majority white, about 53%. And it matters. Residential segregation matters. I'm going to come back to that. Race is important in getting ahead. A Pew study in 2019, just recently, found that 56% of whites think that being white helps them get ahead. More than half of white people say, yeah, I do have privilege as a result of being white. And 80% of whites who are either democratic or lean democratic believe that the legacy of slavery still affects blacks a great deal or a fair amount. Even among those who are Republican or lean Republican, 40% believe that as well. Race still matters. The other thing I want to talk about that is an idea in critical race theory, and again, I want to emphasize that this is not taught in elementary school, middle school, or high school, is that racism is structural, that it's not biological. Do I hear you laughing? Race is not biological, but children look like their parents. Can you imagine you're in the labor and delivery room, in walks this black lady, she's pregnant, she's about to deliver, with her is her black husband, out pops a Chinese baby. You, I wouldn't want to be in that room, that would be one extremely angry husband, right? because children look like their parents. But even though that's true, and I acknowledge that that's true, there is no biological basis for race, no clear biological marker for different races. As legal theorist Ian Haney Lopez puts it, and I quote, there are no genetic characteristics possessed by all blacks, but not by non-blacks. Similarly, there is no gene or cluster of genes common to all whites, but not to non-whites. And this is not because people have not searched for it. An intense search in the 19th century 
was undertaken for such genetic evidence. Instead, what biologists found was that 89 to 94% of genetic variation is within groups of people commonly considered to be the same race. Most of the genetic variation overwhelmingly is between people of the same race rather than across races. In fact, more genetic variation exists between Spaniards and Swedes, who are all considered white, than there is between Spaniards and North Africans. One group considered white, the other considered black. It's a social convention. And there are no sharp genetic divisions between blacks and whites. I know that there's this biological variation that we can see, so it's assumed that that 9% of variation that happens across races accounts for that, and that it uh, accounts for the visible phenotypic differences in skin color, hair type, facial features, all of that, but that it doesn't affect intelligence, morality, criminality, the things which we so often connect to ideas of race. Another piece of evidence for the fact that race is this social convention is that arbitrary definitions of race, which have varied across time. So for many, for centuries in the United States, black people were categorized by having a single drop of black blood since the 18th century. So if you were one 32nd black, if, so if you had you know, your great, 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 great grandparent who was black, you were black. The one drop rule. And that's the way the census originally dealt with black people. But over time, the census has changed its categorization policies. And now people self-report. So if you were Walter White, who was a leader in the NAACP, but if you saw his photograph, you would think he was white. Funny that his name was Walter White. But he was actually black because he was heading the NAACP. He wasn't pulling a Rachel Dalazel pretending to be black. No, he was actually black. But today, he could just report that he was white. In fact, today, there's a biracial category. He could say he was biracial. So the definitions have just changed over time. People who used to be black became biracial or even white, the very same person. And there's a variation across uh, geographically. You know, in Jamaica, I might not be considered, I wouldn't be considered black, I'm brown. Right, and in Brazil, there are perhaps eight different racial categorizations. And it used to be that there were many more in Jamaica. And still in Central America, there are all of these variations. Race is arbitrarily decided. When you come to the United States, you might not have been black if you lived in the uh, Dominican Republic or if you lived in Jamaica. You come to the United States and you're black. That's okay with me. I was always black. But for some people, it's a shock when they arrive. In addition, I'd add one other idea to this notion of race not being biological, that what we think about as race is often related to ideas about social status. If you're black, it's assumed you're poor. So middle-class blacks, a study called Blue Chip Black, uh, done by Karen Lacey, she talks to middle-class blacks who are like, if I'm going to the store, I have to dress a certain way. Because everybody in the store, you know, the people who work in the store are going to assume I don't belong, that I'm poor just because I'm black. So if you're white and you're middle, upper middle class, maybe you could go in your ripped jeans, but if you're black, you better not wear that because they're going to assume you're poor. And if you're a young black male, they're going to assume you're violent and threatening. And Claude Steele, social psychologist, right, wrote this book called Whistling Vivaldi, talking about being a graduate student at the University of Chicago and watching everybody. As, you know, graduate students work late. He's going home uh, late at night, and everybody's crossing the road and avoiding him he, because he just assumed that he was dangerous and threatening. But if he whistled Vivaldi, some European composer, then they would know that he wasn't just what he appeared to, to be to them. I've been with my husband, and some of you have seen him, right? He is not, I mean, he has a big personality, but he's not that 
He's not a big, threatening guy. And he wears these little round horn ring glasses. At least he used to. Now he wears all of these uh, stylish frames. But he used to just wear these round horn ring glasses. He'd always have books under his arms. And we would, I saw women scurry away from this perfectly non-threatening figure. We were in Paris getting into an elevator, and we saw people not get in the elevator when they saw him. The assumption is that if you're black and male, you're violent. He wasn't that young. So these, and these traits that we often associate, now some of it is what Bill Wilson calls statistical discrimination, okay? So violence is more common young, among young black males than among other young males. That's a statistical fact. And so people say, the truth is, I know this is more common here, and so they react to that. But the very fact that it's more common among young black males, many of these traits we associate with race actually, to a significant degree, are a result of the structure of our society. Even decisions made by the US government. I love the work of Ira Katz Nelson, a book called When Affirmative Action Was White. Katz Nelson writes about the fact that the New Deal in the 1930s, we're not talking about the 19th century, we're not talking about slavery, we're talking about the middle of the 20th century, that the New Deal was, a massive, was massively discriminatory against black people. So when the New Deal introduced for the first time Social Security and unemployment insurance, which was extremely important in the Great Depression, but there were two industries that were excluded, farm laborers, domestic workers, deliberately excluded by Southern Democrats in the Congress because those were the two industries in which blacks were most heavily represented. The second strategy that they came up with was to implement this on a state-by-state -state basis, so benefits had to be applied for locally. Now, on one level, you might say to me, that's just subsidiarity, that kind of makes sense to our Catholic minds. But when you know that if these are administered in Mississippi, then blacks there are going to be discriminated against and excluded, then it's not just about subsidiarity. Katz Nelson says that the GI Bill, which was a very important contributing factor to the establishment of the black middle class, was, I mean, the white middle class, I beg your pardon, had an important role in creating an enduring racial wealth gap between blacks and whites. The GI Bill gave veterans coming back from the war access to loans to purchase homes, to job training, to scholarships for college. But black Americans were systematically excluded. They were denied loans for education and homes. They were refused mortgages. They were excluded from colleges, especially in the South where most of them lived. And the result of that systematic exclusion was that they were vastly economically disadvantaged. And what's really deep is that it's a disadvantage that grows over time because most Americans enter the middle class and have the, hold their wealth in terms of home ownership. So when this massive flood of home ownership was starting, blacks were left out. But it wasn't only, let me just quote Katz Nelson before I tell you another way in which blacks uh, were excluded from home ownership. At no other time, Katz Nelson says, at no other time in American history have so much money and so many resources been put at the service of the generation completing education, entering the workforce, and forming families. Yet comparatively little of this largesse was available to black veterans. But the story of redlining in, 19, in the 1950s, as the suburbs are established in the United States, is very similar. And the, it's so not only the legislation of the New Deal, but the Federal Housing Authority excluded blacks from home ownership. Federal Housing Authority provided indispensable support, ensuring mortgages, contributing in a major way to building the white middle class. 
which provided access to capital to build wealth. But they classified black neighborhoods as uninsurable, which meant that black people couldn't buy homes. And they were blocked from purchasing homes in the suburbs. Blacks couldn't get mortgages. They couldn't get loans to repair homes. They couldn't build equity in their homes. And in 1984, there was a huge racial difference in racial wealth. White households, their net worth was $39,000. Black households, their net worth was 9% of that, $3,400. Right now in Boston, the net worth of a black person is $8, a white person, quarter of a million. City with the largest racial wealth inequality gap. What's really difficult is that it compounds. If you got in on that home ownership from the New Deal, from the GI Bill in the 1930s, or the expansion into the suburbs in the 1950s, your house increased in value every year, right? If you were left out, if you come along and buy your house in 2014 or 2021, you're buying at the prices which are much inflated compared to the prices at which the people who bought back then purchased their homes. It's like compound interest. You're falling further and further behind. So I just want to remind you, right? We're talking about truth and history, and we're talking about the good things in American history. The, the fact that slavery was ended. America is the only country that went to war with itself to end slavery. The fact that you had the civil rights movement and that black people, that the, the segregation in the South was ended and the terrorism in the South was ended. Real accomplishments in American history but we have to tell the whole truth. We have to recognize the role that slavery played in the Civil War. We have to recognize that racism is something that affects black people in employment, that affect, affects black people in where they live, that makes a difference in their lives. We have to recognize that the government has played a role, the US government in the past has played a role in disadvantaging black people economically, both in the New Deal and again, the Federal Housing Authority with redlining. I hear you all groaning. I hear it. Doesn't Dr. Rivers know that this is a holiday? Yes, we are celebrating. We're celebrating Dr. King. And it is true, all is not lost. There has been great progress. We've had the first black president elected. And we did that before you, uh, England had their first non-white uh, prime minister, right? We've had two black secretaries of state, Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell. And I guess you guys, I bet you guys don't know this, but City Core, the head of global banking there was a black man, Ray McGuire. We've had black heads of American Express and the first woman president of Harvard no, not true. The first woman to be president, the first black person to be president of Harvard is a black woman. The first black person to be president of Harvard is a black woman, Claudine Gay, who has just recently been named president. We've come a long way. And she's not the first black woman to be president uh, in an Ivy League college. President uh, Brown University had that honor. There is much to celebrate, but we have to face the truth. One of the things about residential segregation, according to the work of Thomas Shapiro, he found that not only did whites prefer to live with other whites. So I told you before about a study that was done in San Francisco. This is a multi-city study. And in 1994, 13% of whites, he found, wanted to live in all white neighborhoods. Worse than that, he found that there was a gap between stated preferences and actual behavior. And when he traced where whites moved, 984 out of 1,000 whites would either stay in mostly white neighborhoods when they moved or move into mostly white neighborhoods. 
which is much higher than their stated preference for diversity. According to Shapiro, he found that they moved out of or avoided integrated communities. And the result, according to Shapiro, is that blacks are concentrated in neighborhoods with weak public services, hospitals, transportation, police, fire protection. He goes on to say residential segregation by economics and race is a principal reason for unequal educational resources. Black kids simply don't have access to good schools. 75% of black students attend schools that are predominantly poor, according to data from 2016. And this is the most important predictor of the racial gap in educational achievement. Black students go to poor schools in almost all cities in the US, whether it's old industrial cities in the Northeast and Midwest, or growing new cities in the Southwest. And these schools have limited resources, limited technology, limited facilities, more students in each class, they have less qualified teachers, they have fewer educated parents in the families, they have fewer two-parent families to support student learning, and all of this is exacerbated by white residential choices, which help deepen educational segregation. Most white families are sending their children to schools in mostly white, well-to-do neighborhoods. You can see the pattern in Boston. You know, uh, young professionals, white professionals would want to live in the city. Neighborhoods that were once working class are now upper middle class as these professionals move in until they have children. And then they leave the city so that they can move to a white neighborhood with white schools. It's not just about putting their kids in schools with white children, but according to Shapiro, almost half of whites would reject a school where more than 50% of the students were minorities without checking out the educational performance of the school. It's not just that these schools are better, it's that they don't even check in many cases. And so they effectively resegregate schools by moving to neighborhoods with whiter schools. And Shapiro points out that, you know, uh, some people want to argue that it's self-segregation, that black people prefer to live with other black people and go to school with other black people. But what Shapiro found was that parents have similar aspirations for their kids regardless of race or class. Everybody wants a kid to go to a good school. And according to sociologists Glenn Farbaugh and Chad Farrell, residential segregation leads to heightened exposure to various social ills, reduced access to resources and services, and it is the origin of many other types of racial disparities, limiting access to jobs, limiting access to education, limiting access to health care, and limiting access to beneficial social networks. But the good news is that there is, there can be victory. Doc, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. scored a victory for the United States. He was a dedicated leader. He faced danger, hostility, and jail. He confronted violent police forces. He was thrown into jail in Birmingham and other places in the South. He was imprisoned once in a police van inches from a snarling police dog as they drove him around the city. But he did not give up. He worked tirelessly to raise funds for to challenge and end segregation in the South, traveling across the country, exhausted, speaking out against it, and raising funds that others could do the same. In fact, when he was awarded the Nobel Prize, he donated the entire prize, to the, the financial prize that comes with it, to the civil rights movement. He was unwavering in his pursuit of racial justice. And he fought for economic justice because he recognized the disadvantage that black people faced. He marched with garbage workers in Memphis when they went on strike. He spoke out against unchecked capitalism. Tyler talked about the fact that Dr. King has been sanitized for us, that we just see him as this you know, kindly Santa Claus figure. But he was an outspoken radical against injustice and pointed to the evils of unchecked capitalism. He had the courage to stand up against the Vietnam War 
from very early in the protest movement. He criticized the military industrial complex despite it being extremely unpopular, despite the opposition of his own people, despite the cost to the civil rights movement, he stood for justice. But I have to admit, and there is a contradictory strain that constantly troubles me. He was deeply flawed in his personal life and committed absolutely, utterly reprehensible sexual conduct which we must tell if we're going to tell the truth. But he helped to inspire thousands. King didn't do this by himself. There were thousands who went out to march for civil rights, black and white alike, rich and poor, who went out to march for civil rights, who won the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights of Act of 1965, and more than that, who changed the South who ended the terrorism, the lynching, who ended the conditions that led to the death of Emmett Till because he whistled at a white woman, who changed the culture so that a black person had to step off the sidewalk if a white person was coming, who transformed the South where black people could look white people in the eyes, which they had not been able to do. They did this, and we, we are called to serve as they did. This is not just about politics. I'm not just up here making an appeal about politics. I'm talking about the call to speak the truth in love. I'm talking about our commitment to Christ. I'm talking about the one who told the truth when he knew he would hang on a cross and die because he spoke the truth. Jesus is calling us to speak the truth in love. Jesus is calling us to tell the truth about U.S. history, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He is calling us not just to tell the truth, but to make sure that our schools teach the truth, to make sure that our children understand what really happened, that they know the history of this country, the accomplishments and the failures, and that they can see the consequences, that they can see that this persists, and that together we can change it. Jesus promises us that the truth will set us free and that we will have the victory. Let us tell the truth. Amen. So I first want to say, as they do in the black church, to God be the glory. God be the glory. Thank you. Are there questions, anybody, or comments, or? I don't see any hands. Oh, sorry, please, go right ahead. So it's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure everybody understands really what happened during Reconstruction. But there was a 10-year period in which, immediately after emancipation, when black people had the right to vote, and when, in fact, they served in Congress, and they served on state legislatures across the South, and when they exhibited extraordinary leadership at that time. But white Southerners were committed to a system of white supremacy. And when the North became tired of imposing equality by actually having troops in the South and withdrew troops from the South, 
with the Hayes Compromise. By means of terror, trickery, and uh, changes in the law, blacks were denied, they lost the right to vote. I think that kind of transformative uh, development was very threatening, and I suspect it would be threatening today to some, but not to all. There was a march uh, after Charlottesville, after the incident of Charlottesville, I'm not sure when that was, 2019 maybe, there was a march in Boston, a tiny group who wanted to uh, come out in defense of, um, I think they claimed it was for uh, free speech, but in fact it was really, there was a racist undertone. 40,000 white people marched, they weren't all white, but 40,000 people, most of them white, because Boston does not have that big of a black population. 40,000 people marched in opposition. America has changed. And maybe today it would be possible, but it would still be an uphill battle because there's still people who, one, don't know the truth. And that's why it's so important for us to teach in our schools what really happened. And two, some people who, knowing the truth, are threatened by it. Other questions or comments? Yes. Hi. Welcome. Oh, boy, that's really a good question. Uh, I was talking to some of the young men earlier, and I think one of our biggest problems right now is polarization that people don't talk to each other that they disagree with. I think one of the first steps we have to work on is trying to heal that gap because somebody like uh, William Darity, who's an economist at Duke, argues for reparations to try and correct some of what I've been talking about. The, the magnitude of the reparations, I think, make it unlikely that we will ever have anything of that let that happen. I mean, we're talking about COVID level uh, expenditures, billions of dollars. But I think we'll never take a step if we are so divided. We, we can't act on this while we're so divided. I think that's the first thing, to try to find some common ground that people on the right and people on the left can agree is fair and just. And I think another important thing that I've talked about is educating ourselves so we know the truth. Go read for yourself when affirmative action was right, white. Read narratives from here to equality. You don't have to agree with it, but just read and find out what actually happened. And make sure that our schools are teaching the truth. In too many Southern schools, People, I, I've had students in my class tell me that they did not know that slavery was the central cause of the Civil War in the 21st century. Yet if you look back at the history, if you just look at those history, the history of those acts that were passed by Congress, it is clear the country was in turmoil. I don't want to suggest that states' rights didn't have a, have a role to play. Yes, they did or that defending and protecting the Union didn't motivate a lot of those young men who went to war. Yes, it did. But what caused that split in the Union? What caused that division between the states? It was a question of slavery. So we've got to make sure that we are educating our, ch our children, that they know the truth. I don't think we can move forward until more people are exposed to the truth. And then I think we have to ask ourselves some tech, uh, tough questions. How do we tackle racial, residential segregation? You can't make people live where they don't want to live, right? That's crazy. But how do we tackle it in a way that we don't have, look, there's a study that found that the level of poverty that black people experience in Chicago is unique in the country. No other group experiences that level of poverty. And poverty in rural Appalachia is incredible. But even there, not as intense as in uh, 
inner city of Chicago. So we have got to do something about residential segregation. And there's a scholar at American Enterprise Institute who has this idea not of simply systemic racism, but systemic disadvantage. Saying, look, it's that the people in rural Appalachia are suffering from some of the same systemic problems that the people in the inner city of Chicago are struggling from. And that we could go further to addressing these systemic problems if we don't simply cast them as race. Because they affect people who are black and they affect people who are white. I think that that is a hopeful note. If we can find a way to bridge a racial gap and deal with some of these problems that affect us all. Do I have time for another question, Tyler? Okay, there was one up here. Yes, Angel. Now, I don't think it should be. Critical race theory is really a sophisticated legal theory that we should not be trying to teach in K through 12, and which is rarely mentioned in uh, college classes. And I think that that's all appropriate. I think what Christopher Rufo and people like him are trying to do is to raise hostility to telling the truth about American history. And that's what I think we need to do. We need to say, and there have been bills passed in several states about what can and can't be taught about slavery. That's what we need to take on, Angel. We have to figure out how we get to tell the truth in classrooms about American history. Celebrating the good things, celebrating Abraham Lincoln, celebrating uh, the way in which the United States has even it supported what's happening in Ukraine, supported Ukrainians, celebrating the role that the United States played in, the, in World War II, celebrating the good things about the country, but confronting the bad things as well. So I think we're out of time, Tyler. Thank you all very much. And Dr. Rivers, thank you so much for joining us here at Benedict, and we, we really appreciate your wisdom. And and I want to thank all of you for being here uh, this evening. Um, it's a testament to uh, our values here at Benedict and our commitment uh, to make this an issue that we keep uh, growing and educating ourselves in. So in a special way, too, I want to thank again uh, Tyler Shepard for his leadership in this event. I want to thank the Freedom Fellows uh, sitting in the front here. Uh, and also I want to thank the Black Student Union uh, for their sponsorship and leadership here. All right, and let's close with a prayer. Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, thank you for the grace to gather here this evening to remember and celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. King wrote that, quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Lord, convict us tonight to fight against injustice in all its forms, especially against the injustice of racism. Grant us all the grace to see you present in each and every person you have created. Make us cooperators in Dr. King's dream for this country, the dream that this country will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. Lord, send us out from this auditorium as messengers and protagonists of your gospel message to be true ambassadors of light and hope for our world. We ask our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Have a good evening. God bless.